Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that very detailed introduction. I've forgotten most of those things I've done. <laughs> <laughs> really strange. Um, but thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for sparing your lunchtime to be here. It's very important that we get to know one another and we get to know each other meaningfully. If we are to build relationship, which includes friendship or any other relationships that we may have, um, it requires a tremendous amount of understanding and that understanding comes from knowledge. Sensitivity and respect. And sensitivity and respect only comes when you accept your colleagues who are different to you. I don't say tolerate them, but accept them. Um, I have moved on from the word toleration a long time ago. Um, just so that you don't mind me saying, um, toleration was a colonial term. We've, we've moved on, I think, a long, long time ago. I'm equal to you and you're equal to me. We're all human. And that's my premise. For well, anything that I say and any discussion that I engage in or any debates or discussions that I have with anybody. Ramadan is a very important month for not just Muslims, but I think for everybody. And I'll begin by saying why I mean it's very important for everybody. In the month of Ramadan, Muslims become very charitable, extraordinarily charitable. I don't know whether you know, but uh, over the last three years, every Ramadan, British Muslim population, less than 3% of the total British population, have donated more than 100 million pounds each Ramadan, each year for the last five years. So that's 500 million pounds, only in the month of Ramadan, every year for the last five years. Now that's a phenomenal achievement for a community who is supposed to be very poor and cash trapped. As supposed to be BME, we have to do a special program for them. English training, integration program, this program, that program. And yet this community gener generates more than 100 million each year in charity alone. They give. They give from their hard earned cash. And being a fundraiser at the forefront of fundraising, I can tell you, in my own lifetime, I would probably have raised close to 500 million pounds in the last 25 years, mainly from British Muslim community. Now, that staggering figure actually doesn't do justice to the amount of work people do voluntarily, not just using their money, but money otherwise never mentioned, but do without even asking anything in return. Month of Ramadan is one of those months when the entire conversation changes. The psyche changes, the mentality changes, the attitude changes, everything changes. It's like a magic button has been pressed. Somehow a Muslim transforms into this amazing butterfly from being a moth before. Um, and this butterfly has so many amazing traits. And I really cherish the month of Ramadan because I not only enjoy the fact that I don't have to eat. I know it's strange, I don't like food very much. I don't have a bad relationship with food, don't worry. Um, I'm quite a healthy man, but I feel I only eat because I need to eat. I am not a foodie. I don't live to eat. I often have an argument at home with my wife when she serves glorious food and I say, I just want this much. She says, I've wasted all that time cooking. Yes, you have. <laughs> <laughs> Gracefully. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Ramadan is about learning how to control our habits and behavior from our food to our character from what we see and how we speak and what we hear, and our relationship with fellow human beings and our environment with the animals. Each and every aspect of our life is being fully trained. Now, if I was to tell you that, uh, or if I told you that I've been attending a physical boot camp for the last 25, 30 years, every year for a month, you would think I'm super fit. Muslims attend spiritual boot camp every year for 30 days for as long as they've been fasting. I'm 47 and I've given my age away. I've been fasting from the age of nine, never missed a single one, maybe even earlier, seven or eight maybe. I've never missed a single one, so nearly 40 years of fasting. So I should be spiritually super fit, but unfortunately I'm a human. So I'm not always able to sustain my fitness of spirituality that I get, the boost of it. That's why it's every year. You. Go up and you wane, and you go up again and you wane. That's life. What do we actually do in the month of Ramadan? So, month of Ramadan is known as month of the Quran. Quran is the scripture that Muslims follow. Um, it's a continuation of what came to Moses, Abraham, David, Jesus. That's what Muslims believe. It came to those prophets from God as revelation. 
Muslims receive, Prophet Muhammad received the Quran. Ladies and gentlemen, Quran, as perhaps some of you may be not very familiar with the text and the context, actually has more than one third dedicated to Prophet Moses, Jesus, Joseph, Abraham, and many other good prophets of the Jewish tradition, as well as Christian tradition. Remaining is about inspiration of people and civilization, instructions, and less than 2% to 3% of the Quran contains rules and regulations. But Quran is a book of inspiration, a guidance, and not to be understood or misunderstood, because if you take literally, you will misunderstand. It's got context. Quran came at a time when there was depth of darkness. Prophet Muhammad was an illiterate man. He did not know how to read or write. He goes into meditation in the middle of a mountain for months on end. His wife and his entire people in Mecca know that the man has gone somewhere to find himself. And he one day comes back and says, guys, God has just spoken to me. And he says, read. You can't get any more self-deprecation than that. He doesn't know how to read and write. And he comes and tells his people, God has told me to tell you to read. If I was next to him, I would have said, Muhammad, but you don't know how to read. Obviously, right? right. The reason why he was self-deprecating was because it wasn't his word. No king or queen or philosopher or um, an inventor would come and self-deprecate his own invention. But he did. Um, and the first word of revelation wasn't to fight or declare jihad against everybody else or any other misnomers that we hear so often falsely attributed to Muslims and Islam. But the first word was read, Iqra. Ladies and gentlemen, in the first five revelation, Iqra means read. It appears three in three different contexts, the context of reading. First, God says, read in the name of God who created you. Then he says, read. But this second reading is about researching. And the third mention of learning is he says, and we, he taught humanity knowledge with the aid of pen, knowledge that they knew not. Why is it that the first revelation of Islam, the first revelation of Quran, the first word Muhammad, peace be upon him, utters to his people, are all about reading, all about researching, all about writing and sharing the knowledge that you have? It's because Islam believes that without knowledge, you can't discover yourself, you can't discover your society, you can't even discover God. In fact, there is a saying of the Prophet where he says, the sleeping of a man or a woman who is learned is better than the whole night worship of a person who is not learned. So if you're learned, you could be sleeping and getting more rewards than a person who is not learned. And if they were to stay awake all night and worship God. There's a very particular reason why reading was uh, and learning was an emphasis in is an emphasis in, emphasis in Islam. So Quran is not a book of prohibitions, rules and regulations. Is not about fire and brimstone. Is not about killing. Is not about destruction. Is not about anarchy. Is not about any of that. Quran is about healing humanity from depth of spiritual decadence, bankruptcy, to bringing them to realizing their fuller potential, both intellectually, physically, and spiritually. That's the Quran. It came down in the month of Ramadan. So Muslims value the month of Ramadan tremendously because the entire human history changed forever. Course of humanity changed forever. Human history would, could never be looked at in the same way ever again since the advent of the Quran. Our continent, Europe, and the rest of the world were in the depth of darkness. Somehow a light was lit in the middle of Arabia that gave rise to science, technology, that gave rise to medicine, what we have today gave rise to architecture, philosophy. I can go on and on and I don't want to just claim all the claims saying Muslims invented everything. I'm not saying that. I'm saying inspired by Quran, a group of people who were Bedouins, who had no knowledge of anything, somehow became the pioneers of the world. What happened? That's why Muslims value the month of Ramadan so significantly. It began then. Heavenly light was dropped on this earth. Month of Ramadan is a month of reflection. Reflection where you just don't read the Quran to yourself and you just regurgitate or like a parrot, just read it without understanding. No, you're supposed to reflect on it, every word. You know, Quranic words, the Arabic words contained within the Quran is not just the literal meaning, but you have to experience it. 
Now, let me give you an example. There is a verse in the Quran, and I'll read it to you in Arabic first, and I'll give you the meaning of it. God says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا إِلَى الطَّيْرِ فَوْقَهُمْ صَافَّاتٍ Just listen to the way I've read it. أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا إِلَى الطَّيْرِ فَوْقَهُمْ صَافَّاتٍ God is saying, and do you look up? أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا إِلَى الطَّيْرِ Look up at the birds above you. فَوْقَهُمْ above you صَافَّاتٍ Now the Arabic has to be read just like the bird is on flight. So because the bird is on flight with its wings spread, you have to elongate it by saying صَافَّاتٍ Otherwise you can't experience the the, the flight of the bird. And then he says, وَيَقْبِضُمْ When they want to come down, all they do is they pull their wings together. Just like the bird on full flight, and you've seen it many times, when it wants to catch its prey, it pulls its wings together and shoots down at 30, 40, 50 miles an hour. So you have to read it like that. وَيَقْبِضُمْ Suddenly you pull your wings together. The entire Quran is like that. Every word must be felt, understood, and reflected upon. It's not just to be picked up from isolation because you will not understand it. So it's a month of reflection. Reflection about your origin. Where did you come from? And I said to a group of people the other day, if my existence on this earth is all about eating, how many times have I eaten and I had indigestion? It doesn't make sense. How many, if all of my purpose of my life was all about drinking, how many people have drunk so many exquisite drinks and had huge hangover and regret afterwards? How many people have had misery in their life because of abuse of alcohol? If my life was all about sleeping, how many times have I slept and woken up more tired than I went to sleep? Every time I look at it deeply, it defeats the purpose. It can't be the purpose of my life. It's one aspect of my life. So I need to reflect on it. Why am I here? Why am I different to the animals? So Muslims begin to reflect in the month of Ramadan. Their purpose, their belonging, their goal. What is it they're doing on this earth? Month of Ramadan is a, an intensely month of mercy. Mercy? What? You're fasting whole day, how is it merciful? Yes, because you suddenly connect with the poor and the needy of the world because they have not eaten. If you ever have experienced starvation, you would know what it means not to have food. If you ever seen other people poor, you would not know what it means. Unless you've experienced what it means to not have food, you will never know the pain of hunger. Try it in the month of Ramadan. You wake up early in the morning at 2 o'clock, you eat some food and you don't eat anything. Nil by mouth until 9 o'clock in the evening. It's getting shorter now. It was 10.30, not that long ago. Nil by mouth. Try that for 30 days. Mercy will ooze out of you for your fellow human beings. For what they do. Mercy will ooze out of you for the animals which we kill to eat. The birds that we kill, the animals that we kill, just to be able to survive. Each and every one of them you'll have tremendous respect and mercy for. And of course God's mercy. Abundant mercy is available for those who go through this amazing program. It's month of forgiveness. A month where you forgive yourself, forgive others around you and ask God to forgive you too. Now forgiveness, ladies and gentlemen, is a very difficult one because we can't forgive often. Many people have done many wrongs against us. I'll give you one story that I will... It will put a perspective to what I'm about to say. I was going into my mosque to lead Friday prayers. I walked in and a gentleman came running saying, excuse me, excuse me, Imam, can you please wait for a second? I said, sure. So I stopped the lift. My son was with me. He looked at me and he goes to me, do you have a minute? I said, no, I don't have a minute. A sermon is about to start. Just literally in a minute. He said, okay, 30 seconds then. I said, okay, go ahead. He goes, I'd like you to, I would like to ask you to forgive me. Forgive you for what? He goes, I've been backbiting you for the last five years. I've been slandering you, gossiping about you. I've been spreading lies about you all over for the last five years. And my conscience have been, has been biting me. But I've never had the courage to come and say I'm sorry. I would like to say I'm really, really sorry. And the reason why I'm saying sorry, I'm going to have a heart bypass operation today. And I told my surgeon, please give me half an hour, I'll be back. And I've just come out of my hospital looking for you. I knew you were going to be here today. Would you please forgive me? What do you say to a person like that? Ladies and gentlemen, I looked at him and said, yes, I forgive you. But I cried in that process. I cried because I suddenly realized he's a better man than me. He asked me for forgiveness. Many people I've wronged have not asked for forgiveness. He's humble than me. I'm arrogant. He's more down to earth than me. Because I don't see my mistakes. He has seen his. Even if it's after five years. There's a part of my brain that says, how dare you forgive him? He's been spreading all this rubbish about you. How will you repair that? 
And there's the other part of my brain that said, this man has realized his mistake. God who helped him to mend his way, God who has inspired him to come and say sorry to you, will also be able to mend other people's hearts and their perceptions about you. Forgive him. That struggle in my head. But I forgave him. And I felt liberated. I felt so happy that I forgave him. Month of Ramadan is when we Muslims go out of our way to ask our fellow human beings to forgive us for mistakes that we have made. And we forgive them. And we ask God to forgive us. Because we also realize that our mistakes against God, He will forgive out of His generosity and mercy because He's infinitely merciful. But my fellow human beings are not infinitely merciful. We are all selfish, mean sometimes, very cruel, very much agenda oriented so i have to go out of my way to ask forgiveness so month of forgiveness it's a month of charity i've already mentioned we give you know ladies and gentlemen i've been on stages i've been on television i've done programs where people have given given and given how do they give i have no idea so much respect they have and i feel very honored that they respect me for this i have i fundraised one evening i've gone out into the street i'm walking along Somebody stopped me, an elderly lady stopped me saying, excuse me, young man, yes, could you come with me? Why? I have made a promise to you to give you some money, but I haven't got the money with me. I didn't have the money with me, but since I see you now, come with me. Grabbed my hand, took me to the bank, took 500 pounds out of the bank and said, here, the money I promised you. But who the hell am I? Where am I going to take this money? She goes, I made a promise to you yesterday that I'll give you 500 pounds. You take the money and give it to everybody, anybody you like. It's not just the trust. It's about the generosity that they have. To give without asking. There is a Quranic verse which says, And they feed the poor and the needy and the orphans and the wayfarers, not because they want gratitude and recognition from the world. No, they just do it because of the love of God. They have love of God that they give without even asking. And I experience it every Ramadan from the Muslim community that I see every day. They give and they give and they give. So it's a month of charity. It's a month of change, a transformation. Change in the sense that we change our habits. People who smoke normally, they don't smoke throughout the day from Ramadan, none whatsoever. Regretfully, some break their fast with cigarette, regretfully. I always say to people, if you haven't smoked for 19 hours, throw it away, you don't need it. You don't need to smoke again. And so many people don't smoke again because they find this an opportunity to get rid of their bad habit. Month of Ramadan is about changing our character, our habit in the sense of, if you are familiar with people who are backbiting and gossiping, there is a very powerful saying that God does not want the fasting of those people who despite fasting will go and backbite, will go and gossip and, and do all sorts of things. So the companion said, oh prophet, what is backbiting? He said, to speak behind your fellow brothers or sisters, your fellow human beings, anything negative behind their back. What if it is true? He said, then that is backbiting. What if it is false? Then that is slandering. Both in Islam are prohibited. So if you've got Muslim colleagues who are backbiting and slandering, refer them to the Quran. They will remember that this is, there is a specific verse in the chapter. The, 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 the entire practice of gossiping, backbiting and slandering is in, it's toxic in work environment. If you ever have to experience that, if you hear people are whispering behind you, it's a terrible thing to be in. I remember uh, when um, Steve Jobs passed away. No, sorry, Microsoft's um, new... Um, or Google's new CEO, the Indian guy, what's his name again? Uh -huh. That's right, he's Google, right? Yeah, he, as soon as he came in, guess what he gave away as his first book to change the culture of his organization? Backbiting. He gave every single director of his company a book to read about backbiting, the effects of backbiting. I asked my congregation once, raise your hand if you promise that you will never backbite. All the hands went up, I hope that they practice what they have <laughs> promised to. Ladies and gentlemen, month of Ramadan is when Muslims begin to change their habits. They change their eating habits. They don't eat too much. They don't become gluttonous. You eat and you realize your stomach is only this big. There's a saying of Prophet Salah, peace be upon him, he said, um, if you, the worst vessel, worst container a human being can fill is their stomach. And if they must eat more than that, they should eat one handful of food. And if you, de if you really need more, then divide your stomach into three parts. Fill one third with solid food, one third with liquid, and keep one third for air. I've been practicing it from, the, from, the, from, it, from 1999, when I was 15 and a half stone, sorry. Much bigger. I've lost a lot of weight ever since, but I've kept it because I only eat one third of my stomach wherever I go. I find that extremely helpful. It cuts out obesity. But these are habits that we develop in the month of Ramadan and we are supposed to continue. 
So lots of habits change in the month of Ramadan. It's a time of transformation. It's the time of when you look, you look with the right eyes. You don't look at the wrong things. You don't listen to wrong things. You don't say the wrong things. You try your level best to become a true human being. Month of purity. A month where you're trying to become as good as possible. You can't be absolutely good because we're human. But as good as possible. So you're not doing things secretly and you're not doing something different outwardly. You are the same consistent person. There is no hidden gender about you. You don't go out at night uh, stealing and thieving and coming and putting on a big face that you are the biggest pious and the most amazing imam in the world. No, you don't do that. You have a consistent life of purity. You lead a pure life, a good life, a decent life. You don't cheat, you don't lie, you don't do all those things that destroy your purity, your stance on it. And the final thing that I want to say is a month of changing our conscience. Ladies and gentlemen, conscience is an amazing thing. Conscience is what makes you and I true human. When our conscience dies, there is not much to live for. When your, our conscience has been desensitized to wrong, there is not much to live for. And Islam is all about reconnecting our conscience to our natural being, who we are. Naturally, the goodness that we have within ourselves, known as the, uh, the element of fitra, element of your natural disposition. Reconnecting with that. That connection comes when you have got a refined conscience that recognizes wrong and right. You're no longer desensitized to wrong. You're no longer brainwashed into accepting that which is wrong as right. Conscience. The entire purpose of the month of Ramadan is to redevelop conscience, refine it. So just to finish off then, the entire uh, conversation that I'm, or what I said, is the month of the Quran, it's month of reflection, it's month of mercy, month of forgiveness, month of charity, month of change, <coughs> month of purity and month of taqwa. For me, it's month of detoxing. All the accumulated rubbish I've accumulated throughout the 11 months, it's a great month to get rid of it. Really amazing way. I make a long list of things I need to do, and I do them one day, one each every day. I try and get rid of them, shed them, get rid of them. I don't want cobwebs in me anymore. I want to be fresh when the month of Ramadan is finished. I want to have a better relationship with God and my fellow human beings, my friends, my relatives, my wife, my children, my parents. I want to have an amazing time with my life that's left. Detoxification, getting rid of the toxic environments that occupy my life or dominate my surrounding or my brain it's about really decluttering my being and that's what i do in the month of ramadan and i find it so refreshing that i get that opportunity every year i'm so grateful that god has given me that opportunity every year to be part of a group of people who do it collectively so we not only fast billions fast many non-muslim friends also join in fasting and i always say Let's do this together because the spirit of fasting will just make an amazing transformation, not in just our physical life, but in our spiritual lives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for some really uh, inspirational words about the well, beautiful month of uh, Ramadan. Um, you very kindly said you uh, received questions, comments uh, from uh, Anybody on Ramadan or indeed on slightly wider topics? So I open the floor. That's why I only spoke for 20 minutes. So that you can ask as many questions as you like. Please. And perhaps you might say who you are when you, when you do, so everybody knows. Uh, my name is Saeed, and I work in the Muslim Policy Network. Uh, my question is, I've spoken to a few colleagues in my, in my teams about Ramadan fasting, and a lot of them have made comments saying, you know, I could never do that because I'll get angry at you Yes, this is a very, very good point actually that uh, some of your colleagues have said that they can't do it because they get grumpy with no food. It is very true. We all have that thing. Food is an integral part of our living. It's about changing your attitude towards food. That's what Ramadan is about. That's why you are developing resilience within you. A, 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 a control mechanism where you don't have to be dependent on food. Food needs to listen to you rather than you listen to food. It can be done. You can train yourself. You can train yourself to do anything. Do you, do you know that if you want to change any habit, according to modern psychologists, you need to do the same thing over and over again for 21 days? 30 days. You've got 30 days to get it right. Maybe three days dry run, 21 days of amazing practice, and then evaluation last few days. It can be done. We are all very much attached to our food. But what is food? Define food. Define the need of a human. 
what food and what is enough. If you can have an intellectual conversation with your food, what would be that? What would be that conversation? Because the, the byproduct of food, the after product of food, isn't worthy of a conversation. So what conversation are you going to have with the product that you eat that you can't have a conversation with afterward? Surely it can't be your entire existence. So if you intellectualize it, it's only food. I'm only going to try and take control over my food. How much? I'm not going to die. I'll be okay. Actually, nobody dies just because there is no, they've not eaten for a day. Prolonged hunger can kill. 20 days apparently, I don't know. But three days of no water. But nobody's suggesting that. We suggest that you only eat during the night time. So it's about intellectually having that conversation with food first. Secondly, asking the purpose that you serve. What, are you, what kind of relationship you want to develop with food. And thirdly, actually taking control. I'm in control, my food isn't in control of me. There are people who are not in control of their food. And they are the ones who suffer the most. And this is not disrespectfully, to, it is not said disre, disrespectfully. I suffered myself when I had bad relationship with food when I was younger. Because I just, without any control, without any discipline, though I was fasting, but I was overeating. Even in the month of Ramadan, I was overeating. Believe you me, mo, a lot of Muslims put on weight in the month of Ramadan. I don't know how. Maybe because they binge eat whole night. That's not also a good relationship. So it's about taking control. And if you can, just tell everybody, and I tell my Muslim friends especially, you will not die because you've not eaten for a day. Nobody has died in the world because you have not eaten for a day. Science, scientists and doctors and medical experts have written, in some cases, doctors even suggest fasting for people nowadays. Because it apparently um, triggers a, a, a restart on your entire body and its internal system. I'm not a medical expert, so I'm not going to go down that route. But spiritually, it's the best thing I can ever do. And that's the best thing I can offer you. Anyone who has fasted with me, and I'm talk talking about some of my non-Muslim friends, they've come back and said, whoa, that was an amazing experience. I remember one young gentleman with me at the age of 19 in my college days. He fasted. He decided to fast with me for the entire 30 days. He was a transformed person for 30 days. I did a TV program for Channel 4, Many, many years ago called Make Me a Muslim, where seven or eight non-Muslim friends and colleagues or people from this country uh, lived with me like a Muslim for, uh, for three weeks. The most powerful impact that they have had and the most transformative um, aspect of Islam that they've ever experienced was fasting. Was fasting. So by far, fasting is an amazing act, even if you don't do it religiously. So if you don't want to do it religiously, fine. Just try and see what you can do with food and your relationship with it. Yes, over here. Oh, sorry. Um, um, my name is Dick Harlow, I'm from the parliamentary team. Um, I just wanted to ask about what practical things that we can do to help colleagues who are fasting during Ramadan. Um, and I ask this thing from the parliamentary team because the parliament is completely unpredictable. So it could be um, that you come to work and you, know, you have a really intense day even though you, you're you know, weaker during Ramadan. What practical steps can colleagues do to make Muslims fasting so easy? Firstly, very generous uh, uh, gesture. Thank you. It's nice to know that you care and you want to make life easier for your Muslim colleagues. By the way, Muslims don't have to stop working, stop life because they're fasting. Just so, no Muslim should make an excuse like this. Sorry, can I take a month off? I'm fasting. No, you can't. <laughs> Get back to work. You know, that's what I would say to my staff. Um, there are certain things you could do. You could negotiate timing. So, for example, they may be sleep deprived because they have stayed up all night or half of the night. Remember, you have to get up in the morning at three o'clock to eat some food and then you pray and then you go to sleep and then you have to wake up again. And already you went to sleep late because you broke your fast at 9.30. You prayed. You went to a mosque to pray again. By the time you came home, it was one o'clock. So you went to sleep at one, you woke up at three and you went to sleep again and you woke up at five and you were at work. So you would see your colleagues very tired looking unless they're crazy like me. I'm hyper. Um, if that's the case, then negotiate with them. See if you can say to them, come a bit later, but go home late. So start your day at 11, finish at 7. You don't have to break your fast till 9.30. You, know, you can negotiate. Um, making 
some adjustments would be useful. But Muslim colleagues also need to realize that they don't need to become a burden because they are fasting. We need to be all aware that we're living in a very multicultural world in which we have to cooperate and we have to coexist. And our fasting doesn't have to be a liability or a burden. There are some practical things that Muslims have to be aware of. One is our breath stinks. Uh, because we have, we have not eaten, I'm sorry. But Muslim guys, don't be fooled by the idea some uh, uneducated people tre- uh, preach that you can't brush your teeth. As completely uneducated. You can brush your teeth, you can use a toothbrush, you can use mouthwash, you can do all of that. I'm saying this because human relationship is very important. You don't want to make your colleague suffer just because you're fasting. Um, there is a saying of, of the Prophet which says the smell of the mouth of the fasting person is sweeter in the eyes of God than the smell of mask. But that's in the eyes of God. <laughs> Not in the eyes of a human. I mean, we're human, unfortunately. Or fortunately. So that's one thing we could do. And Muslim colleagues, if you're fasting, <coughs> negotiate, be transparent and tell your colleagues what you're going through. If you're struggling, talk about it. Uh, shared problem is uh, half the problem. Half the problem is, as far as I'm concerned. So negotiate, talk, be transparent and try and do things together. By the way, those of you who are fasting, and if you're not fasting, those who are not fasting, you don't have to stop eating in front of your colleagues. It's okay. You can eat all you like. Uh, it will tempt them, but that's their test. Uh, they're going through a spiritual uh, boot camp, right? You're helping them. Um, as long as you don't give them food, it's fine. Um, but it's about being sensitive. A lot of people say, you know what, I will just go out and eat. It's okay too. Uh, choose whatever works for you. I have no problem you can have uh, five course meal in front of me. It doesn't bother me at all. Um, but you need to know who your colleague is and how their relationship with food is, what, the, what stage in their life there are, etc., etc. So sleep deprivation, tiredness, being grumpy, being all that is very normal. As long as you are aware of it, you've done an amazing job already. You don't have to do anything different. With parliamentarians, maybe they have to carry some dry dates in their pockets in a plastic bag so that they can break their fast. I do. I carry a small packet of dates that, are, that goes in a plastic packet or in a packet that I don't um, regret afterward because it's smudged everywhere. But I can eat a date. Date is very powerful. It's also something Muslims do in the month of Ramadan. They eat date to break their fast. But peanuts, a small bottle of water with them, just to be able to break the fast. You know when you've fasted, your stomach is shrunk. You can't eat too much. One glass of water and a couple of dates, your stomach is full. You don't want to eat anymore. Maybe you can eat later. But such adjustments would work. I hope it helps. Thank you. Somebody over here. Yeah. So, uh, Zahim, I wanted to ask, when you look at the kind of theory and practice of Ramadan, um, do you notice any kind of major variations, either over time or in different geographical and cultural contexts? I, I do notice certain differences in the time and geographical context, as you say. So fasting is universally, for the Muslims of any background, any, any denomination, mainstream Muslims say they must fast from dawn till dusk. That's a universal rule. Um, however, if you are fasting in Uganda, your timing probably would be far better. Sorry, in South America, my wife wanted to go to Brazil last year because it was eight hours of fasting as opposed to 18 hours here. I said to her, go ahead. <laughs> um, so there is that. Difficulty, I know. But then I remember being blessed uh, fasting when it was winter. Um, so I'm not too fussed about it. It's a good, good way to recognize that um, we are, we're different and our geographic locations give us different taste and flavor to what we do. Um, culturally, do Muslims do different things in the month of Ramadan? Yeah, food-wise, they eat different food. But their ending and beginning of the fast is the same. Their rituals are the same. It's a universal thing. Um, some Muslims choose not to fast That's the choice they've made But according to Islam If you're a Muslim who is an adult You must fast Unless you are pregnant Breastfeeding mother um, Travelling or sick Or maybe very elderly Then you don't fast And if you don't fast Then you have to make it up If you're able to So if I'm travelling I'll make them up If I'm sick temporarily I'll make them up when I'm okay um, if I, a woman who is in a period of breastfeeding or she's pregnant, then she will have to make them up later on when she's not in any of those. Um, however, if you're in a condition that is permanent, uh, such that you can't ever fast again, then you give charity. So at £10 a day, you give to poor, a person who can eat for a whole day, a meal, or three meals a day. It's called 
uh, fidya in Arabic, but it's compensation almost for missing the fast. Um, so these are universal rules. Um, there are no other. Um, if you choose not to fast, then that's between you and God, ultimately. But I know most Muslims fast, even if they don't pray. Fasting is a bit more uh, practiced, uh, cult- a religious uh, tenant of Islam. But would the practice of Ramadan look pretty much the same? Are we talking about the Absolutely the same. I mean, you wouldn't notice major variations in either the theory or the way it's carried out. So would there be any difference if you started from the time of the Prophet till today? Mm-hmm. In fasting or in prayer? No. In terms of the, the, the rules, the rituals. Food, yes. Mm-hmm. Mosques don't look the same exactly. Like the Prophet's mosque didn't have a minaret or a dome. didn't even have a carpet. Um, so these are more manifestations of modern world. Um, no, but the rules are the same. Dawn till dusk, you fast, you kneel by mouth, you obey those rules. Universal rules of Islam are universal rules of Islam. They have always been and always remain the same. There are exceptions, but exceptions are already part of the prescription. The, the lady over there had a hand long time ago. Yeah. Lady of the Green. Thank you, Robert. Um, my name is Imana, I work in Bayes, on international fasting. Uh, my question was, um, so I've got a couple of friends that are interested in fasting with me. Um, and a big part of Um, so my question is, how can you then encourage people who are fasting or are Muslim to kind of connect with that spiritual side? Is that through meditation? Is that through, I don't know. Very good question. And that's exactly what um, I did with that uh, Make, Me, Make Me Muslim program. So all my non-Muslim friends, they of course were not spiritually in any way connected in the same way as I would see it. So what, what we all did was we took a piece of paper and I said, let's evaluate our life. So draw a timeline. And start thinking about all the good things that you've done and note them at the top of the page. And at the bottom of the page, all the bad things that you've done. And all the bad things that you've done, who did you hurt, which bad incident happened in your life. And let's just talk about them. Um, four, three, four of them absolutely broke down at the end of the day. Because this evaluation they'd never done. To me, that's a spiritual journey. If you're able to look at your life and really evaluate it, thoroughly evaluate it, you would discover your soul. You see, um, I think one thing that we often miss, we feed our brain with lots and lots of uh, intellectual discussions, even like we're having one today, I hope. Um, We feed our body with lots of good food. But we often forget to feed our spiritual self. Muslims call it their soul. A starving spiritual self is not a good recipe for human. Because human beings are not just the material intellectual and bodily existence. No, it can't be. It makes no sense. If it, that was the case, then what leaves my body when I die? And what comes into my body when I'm alive? I saw my father die in front of me. And I saw him roll his eyes. And last breath, and that was it. And I wanted to know what left his body. I really wanted to grab it and stop it from going. Something left his body. What's that? And if that's what keeps me going, what do I feed that part of my body? If you ignore that part of your body, I'm sorry to say, an Islamic prescription is that you will be in trouble, spiritually. So, an Islamic recipe is, spend some time in spirituality. By the way, spirituality is also charity. Spirituality is also the voluntary work that you do for your local charity or anyone else. The time that you give for somebody else. The philanthropy that you do, without wanting something in return. So, as long as you do feed your soul with something spiritual, you'll be fine. So I would say to your non-Muslim colleagues, if you are here and if you want to fast, on the day of fasting, focus on yourself, your relationship, evaluate yourself, write down things that you have achieved and thank yourself and pat yourself on your backside and say, well done to myself. And things that you haven't done good, try and see if you can rectify them. And if you have a bad relationship, try and mend them. Pick up the phone to a friend that you've not spoken to for years and years and say, I'm really, really sorry. I have not spoken to you for years. I am very upset that you hurt me so many, many years ago. And I want you to know, it's tough. But for a Muslim, it's 30 days of evaluation. If your non-Muslim colleague is just trying it for one day, it's a bit too intense. Um, Try your best. If you want, you can. If you don't want to, that's your choice. But you can also get the physical benefit of fasting by not eating and drinking whole day. You will. If you're not well, please don't attempt it. I don't want to be liable afterward. If you're not well, and if you need to consult a doctor, please do. Just make sure you're healthy to be able to fast. Hi, it's a similar question to before. So I work in a commercial apartment, and in the past, I've tended to avoid putting out 
tender competition for a, a business opportunity over Ramadan if it's for a, a country that's predominantly Muslim made? Is that something that's generally, do Muslims tend to avoid doing big bits of business in, in that kind of holy month? No. Muslims do biggest business in the world during the month of Ramadan. <laughs> Most shops sell out. Most shops do very well. Saudi Arabia, where they go for uh, Umrah, which is mini, mini pilgrimage in the month of Ramadan, is booming economically. So it is perhaps um, out of generosity and sensitivity that you would do that. But actually, you don't have to. Perhaps the concentration span would be less. Perhaps the available time to do business would be less. But when they do, it's intense. In the Middle East, they turn the clock upside down. They sleep whole day and they do business whole night. But we can't do that in this country. Um, but I don't think our business should stop. But if you're doing business with a country which is predominantly Muslim, and if that's how you will make the best, I don't see a problem either way. But you don't have to go out of your way to shut your businesses just because somebody's fasting. That's not what the Prophet said. That's not what God says. In the Quranic verses, God does not wish difficulty out of fasting for you. He wishes ease out of fasting for you. That's in the Quran itself. On the very, very verse that talks about fasting. Could I mean that there's a possibility, but you'll have to obviously assess that country by country and your region by region. I can't give you a one size fit all. It can't do. But be sensitive, be aware, have a discussion, and there is no harm in asking. There is something that I've been taught uh, when I was younger. The only thing in life you get without asking is a contagious disease. <laughs> Everything else you have to ask for. So ask. Would you mind? Should we change our timing? Would it make it better for you? Or would it make no difference? And if a country like Egypt says yes, then do that. And a country like Bangladesh may say no. Culturally, they are very different. So for example, in Asian countries, they don't turn night and day. They don't. They keep the days going. They fast during the daytime. They do prayers in the, at night time. In the Middle East, they turn it completely over because also the heat doesn't help because their fasting is excruciatingly uh, painful to fast and not have any access to any, any water. But modern Middle East is all air cons everywhere. Every building is air conditioned. So you hardly feel any, feel any heat. But in Africa, in sub-Saharan countries, they have to turn things around. I get that. I understand. So, But please ask. There are Muslim colleagues who probably would know it at your workplace. I would always ask. I, I just don't want to give one answer um, to this. There could also be people who would need a bit more care because they could be more tired, could be lacking concentration. By the way, it happened at the time of the Prophet that there were companions who were spaced out because of fasting. But there were companions who were completely on, on, on top of everything. So we have different um, skills and strengths within human. Just be aware, but you're absolutely right. Don't shut the businesses and think, oh my God, everybody's... I mean, we'd love to have a one-month holiday, I know. If that's an excuse, go ahead and see what happens to your job. But stay with your job, do your business as you should, be sensitive and you'll be fine. And if you want to join in the fasting, even better. Why not? Any other questions from anybody? Oh, Ramadan entirely is divided into three parts. 
The first 10 days are days of mercy, Muslims say. This is what the Prophet said. The second 10 days are the days of forgiveness. And the last 10 days are the days when you seek your salvation. The last 10 days are more specifically very um, emphasized because when the Prophet came out to tell his companions when exactly the revelation came down or began, um, he didn't. So God um, intended for us to make that uh, a journey of our own and a search of our own. So last 10 days are emphasized. So Muslims tend to go to the mosque and stay up the entire night on the last odd numbered days of the 10 days. So 21st, 23rd, 25th, 27th, 29th. They will go to the mosque and they will stay the whole night or they will stay at home and worship extra. Do the more prayers, read the Quran more, reflect more, give more charity. Because they believe this is when the Quran was revealed and we must mark this occasion by our own transformation. Um, so again, it's a good point that you raised. Last 10 days may look absolutely uh, very difficult or it may appear that they're facing difficulty, but they may not. Um, so just being aware of that. But for Muslims, also being aware that you need to tell your colleagues that these are the last 10 days of Ramadan, I'm going to be doing extra. It's like my doctor colleagues. Um, all my friends who are doctors, surgeons in hospitals, they all give their Christmas break away to their Christian colleagues. They say, we'll cover you, you go and have your uh, Christmas break. So uh, many of my friends who are surgeons, if I want to see them in Christmas period, they will say we're working. And I've learned that a lot of Muslims do that, just to be able to facilitate their Christian colleagues so that they can do their celebration, be with their family. So in return, in the month of Ramadan, a lot of my doctor friends and surgeons from many hospitals take the last 10 days off and all of their colleagues cover because they have had that relationship. It's about being like that with one another, give and take, have that relationship, have that friendship. And if you look up for each other, it's more likely that your relationship will be stronger, even if you're different and if you don't have the same faith. By the way, you don't have to have the same faith to be kind and generous with your colleagues, do you? No, you can be kind and generous just because they're a human being. And I think the world would be a far better place if we had that attitude. Yes, young man. Oh, he's giving us five minutes. No, thank you. <laughs> Any further questions from anybody for the last five minutes? Well, I, I just want to... Do you have a question? I, I want. Yes, I please, go ahead. Um, which, about the, the Quran, you uh, recite the Quran beautifully in Arabic. I don't read Arabic or, um, or speak or understand Arabic. Uh, I, am I losing a lot? I mean, of course I can find a translation. It's like, it's like reading Shakespeare in Bangla. Yeah. Or reading Shakespeare in Urdu or any other language, you don't get the same feeling, right? Quran, the Arabic language is very precise. The words are very precise and they're very descriptive. So because the words contain descriptive as well as precise meaning, you need to understand Arabic to be able to understand Quran. But believe you me, a lot of Arabs don't understand the Quran. And 12% of the Muslim population, 12% of the Muslim population speak Arabic language. 82%, so 88% of the Muslim populations of the world don't speak Arabic. So how do they understand Quran? Sad news is they don't. That's why we have this trouble in the world today. They claim to be Muslims, but they don't understand their, they don't understand their scripture. So you, get, you see manifestations which are completely wrong. You see misinterpretations, misapplications. A good example would be woman praying in the mosque. I delivered a, a sermon in my local mosque two months ago saying women should pray in the mosque. There was an uproar in the mosque. How dare you say that? Why should women... Why is it that... So my proposition is men and women both should come to the mosque to pray. They said no. Men should come. And if women want to come, they can, but they don't have to. And I said no. That's a misunderstanding of the saying of the Prophet. So there's an uproar. So they said okay. You have spoken and we didn't disturb, we didn't get the chance to challenge. You must present your evidence in the next sermon that you give. I said, sure. So the following month I came with all my evidence. And I spoke for half an hour, 35 minutes. Absolute silence in the room. Pinned up silence. Not a single person even touted. Because now, looking at the evidence, they realized, oh my God, it was missed in, in translation. The essence of the meaning was lost in translation because of cultural biases, because of other things, including misogyny that took over. Inherently, Prophet would and was never biased based on a person's gender, race or religion, never. 
Quran is not gender specific, it's gender neutral. Muslims have become like that, unfortunately, because they don't understand the text of the Quran or the sayings of the Prophet. The, the, there are good translations available for you to get the closest meaning possible. I would recommend two very good or three, three maybe. First one I recommend is Muhammad Asad, who is a diplomat. You probably would know him. Um, uh, he, uh, a, a German um, a Jewish descent, um, he was Austri Austrian who embraced Islam in his life and he translated the Quran. His translation is probably the closest you would ever get to the true meaning of the Quran in Arabic to English. So that's one I would recommend. So if you're looking for a translation, look for Muhammad Asad. There are a couple of historical error in there, but human translations, of course, there will be error. Don't worry about it. Second one is um, um, Professor Abdul Halim from Sawas. Um, School of Oriental and African Studies, he has translated the Qur'an into more modern English. Um, and um, his translation is very good and very accessible. There's a third one which has been published called, uh, it's, it's available on the internet for free, it's called Sahih International. They've also done a good translation, they've revised and they've changed. And so there are many translations available. I recommend that you refer to a good translation. And if you are stuck, ask. Please don't go for... The Penguin translation of the Quran is probably the worst in the world. Uh, I, I've written to Penguin, but they've just ignored my letter. Um, but that's okay, no, no problem, there are many others. Uh, so, in essence, I'm saying to all of my uh, uh, friends here, Muslims and those who are not Muslims, if you claim to have an identity based and associated by a book and a scripture, and you don't know your book or your scripture, what kind of representative would you be? That's the problem of the world today. More than 90% of the Muslim populations are not familiar fully with the Quran like you should be. Did you know that the most important principle of Islam is not prayer? No, most important principle of Islam isn't fasting. Most important principle of Islam is justice in the Quran. God says, be just. It is through justice you can be the closest to God. Praying is part of justice. Fasting is part of your spiritual justice. But the overarching theme of the Quran is justice. Most Muslims don't know that. I said to Muslims, uh, and I say it often, show me a Muslim country where you will find justice today. And most Muslims are silent. Muslims escape their countries to come to the Western countries, our country, Britain, Europe, America, looking for justice. Wherever there is justice, there is Islam. And that's why I say Britain, Europe is more Islamic than most Muslim countries. Because there is justice here. Essence of Islam has been lost by Muslims for many political reasons. Colonialism, sorry. This building is responsible for some of it. Foreign policies, unethical ones, we're responsible for some of it. Our support for dictators and despots. We talk democracy on one hand, but supply them arms on the other hand. Terrible. We are responsible for some of the miseries in the world. But overarching principle of justice, no matter what happens, there is justice here. You can find justice. The courts will get there one day. You will not find that in Bangladesh. <coughs> it's where my parents come from. You will not find that in Saudi Arabia, <coughs> where Muslims go to do their Hajj. So ladies and gentlemen, the bottom line is, Islam's most important principle is justice. <coughs> And if we lose that, we have lost Islam. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Very generous of your time. No